Candice with Grow Local and today we're going to talk a little bit about soil, not really in depth. Um, these are the kinds of questions that I found that the garden centers get asked. I went there and said, what's the most common question? And they said, nobody knows what to plant in. They don't know anything about their soil. So um, on that happy note, I have my bed here. It's been topped up with compost and this is the fish compost. And what it is typically made of are um, the leftover bits from logging. They call them forest finds. And then they use leftover fish parts that we don't consume. And they compost it for about two years. And this stuff is absolutely wonderful, you guys. It's my favorite. You can get it in bulk at some of the local soil places around. Or you can buy it in an orange bag in town. Um, it acts like sourdough starter does when you're making bread. It just gets all the microbes in your garden going. This time of year is brilliant for applying it. You only need to put about two inches on top of your soil and then let it sit there and it's rainy out here. So just let the rain come through for a couple of weeks. It leaches all the nutrient, a bunch of the nutrients down into the soil. And then you are going to just turn it over lightly. If you've ever folded meringue into a recipe, the egg whites, then you're gonna know what I'm talking about. You just take your trowel or your hoe and just gently fold it over. And that's all there is to it. Now these are, these are prepared beds. Um, I know all I need to do is add a little bit of compost. And at the same time, this type of compost, you only have to add it about once every two years. This isn't a yearly thing. And if you've got compost that you're making at home, even better. But some places, you just get sand. And you guys all know what sand's like. It's just really dry. It doesn't hold water. Everything just drains right through. And not a whole lot of stuff likes growing in it. This is a chunk I took from my garden. And as you can see, I got clay. Lots and lots of clay. Clay, you go like this, you squeeze it. It comes out in ribbons. And you, there's, different, there's different things to look at too. If you've got really gray clay or it's almost blue, that means it's really compacted and it's almost anaerobic. If it is anaerobic, it's gonna smell like diesel fuel. It's just kind of nasty. Um, the other one that you're gonna find is silt or, or loam. And those are really powdery fine and that stuff is absolutely gorgeous. You want that in your garden? I don't have it, but I'm working on it. If you want to find out what kind of soil you've got, go to the garden and stick your trowel in and dig down deep and take out a chunk like I did. And what you want to do is get a jar and fill it about halfway with all your soil that you scooped out and then add some water. A lot of people will add a tablespoon or so of dishwashing detergent because it seems to break it up and then you're going to shake it like crazy and then you're going to let it sit. The heaviest stuff, all your sand, your, all your sand and your gravel is going to go to the bottom. Your clay is going to be in the top part and if you've got any nice stuff like the, the loam or the silt, it's going to be in the center. I will post a chart on the Facebook page for Grow Local that you can go and if you do this, then you just measure. Okay, I've got one third this, one third that and one third that. So what kind of soil do I have? And you'll use the chart and it'll tell you exactly what you've got, okay? There are other kinds of soil that you can get, especially if you're going to be growing in, um, in containers. One's plain peat, good old peat moss. You're not gonna use just peat moss. It's really good for acidic plants. You can put it in the bottom of the hole when you're planting your raspberry or your Blueberries, azaleas, rhodos, those kinds of things. Or you can use it as a mulch. This you don't want to use on its own. It's just too acidic. It does hold moisture. It's absolutely beautiful for that. It does add tilth and bulk. So if you've got clay soil, it's really nice to add this in. 
you're going to find it has wood chips in the lake in it. Um, but when it's dry, it's really, really super hydrophobic. And by that, I mean it repels water. I've got some warm water here. When I pour it in, can you see how it just all raises up? It's not really mixed in. It takes a while. Eventually it will soak in, but seriously, is any of this look like it's wet yet? If I let it sit for a while, it will slowly absorb the water and we'll be off and running. But that's what they mean by hydrophobic and that's why you have to be really careful with your peat moss. This one is one that's called a planter box mix. This one happens to be in a red bag. Um, and you can see the white in it and that's perlite. This has quite a few things added to it. It's got perlite, which is a volcanic glass or rock that they actually put in these great huge furnaces and they, they heat it up to about 850, 900 degrees Celsius and they pop it like popcorn and there's moisture in it and it causes it to expand to seven to 15 times its original size, which simply means it's really light. It's very porous, which means you're gonna get more airflow and you're gonna get more water flow. It holds on to nutrients for your plants. So it's a nice little additive. I don't like it in the garden simply because every time it rains, because the perlite's so light, it floats to the top and you can see it. And that's just something I don't care for. It might not bother you at all. This has your peat moss in it for water retention. It has coir in it, which is coconut fiber. And again, that's really nice if you've got heavy clay soil. That's another thing that you can add in to add some tilth and break it up a bit. Uh, what else? Oh, it's got something called zeolite, which is some sort of a combination of minerals, which actually really helps your plants. It helps your overall health. It stops the nitrogen from leaching out. And it is a permanent solution if you can put zeolite in your garden um, because the microbes don't eat it. They don't break it down. So it'll always be there. And it's just good for your soil. This is another one. I got it at a big box warehouse. And it's, it's really quite nice. It says it's got perlite in it, but I'm assuming that it's really, really broken up a lot because I can't see a whole lot other than little teeny tiny white dots. But this is gonna be my first year for trying this, so I'm kind of excited to see how it works. Because I've got some big pots I'm gonna change over. But for the most part, if you're just doing small scale gardening, you're just starting your vegetable gardens, I would use um, the big bags. There's, oh, that's what I forgot. There's another kind you can get. You can look for the bales of soil. They're about this big by this big and they're really compressed and they will fill up about seven cubic square feet in your garden, which is a fair amount. And again, it looks like, it looks like this. It's got all the perlite on the top. Very, very similar to the red bag one I was talking about. Some of these bales, they don't have as many nutrients, which simply means that you're gonna have to fertilize as you go through the season. And most of us do anyway with the liquid formulas or slow release, okay? But we'll cover that one in another day. And that's about it for the soil that I can think of now. When I see you next time, or actually when I stop filming, I'm gonna go, oh, I forgot to say this and this and this, but I think you've got enough to get going. Thanks. Hey, it's Candace, and today we're gonna do a beginner talk on growing carrots. You can see I've got two hoops in here. I don't really need them. I'll explain it why I've got them, but for while we're filming, I'm just going to take this one out, okay? Carrots are an absolutely lovely crop to grow. They're quick, they're they're finicky. I was going to say they're easy, but they're not. They're finicky. That's why I'm doing this little show here for you. They like really nice loose soil. If you've got sandy soil, hey, they're going to love you. It doesn't mean that you can't grow them in rocky soil or soil that's got a whole lot of debris in it with your wood chunks and stuff. It simply means that 
you're not going to get pretty carrots. You're going to get the weird carrots that have got two legs, three legs. They curve off and do odd looking things, but they're going to taste just fine, you guys. What you want to do with your carrots, with your soil rather, is just make sure it's nice and debris free. You can rake it out with your fingers. You can make sure that if you've got a whole bunch of big chunky, big chunky pieces of wood, they're not really going to bother your carrots a whole lot, but if you don't like them, and like I said, you don't want forked carrots, pitch them. There are several different types of carrots that you can get. I've only got three here. This is a Nantes Corliss. It grows to about six or seven inches long. They're really crunchy, really juicy. I love them. This one is called Little Fingers. And it's really good if you have kids that are just starting to grow things in pots. You can just use a small window box with these because they only grow to about three inches long, which is about the length of your finger. So it's going to be really easy. You can get them to grow it with radishes because the radishes come up within about a month. So they get some fast results. And by the time the radish comes out, the carrots are just starting to bulk up so they get to share the space. This one is called flyaway. A lot of people like that if they're growing their carrots in the ground fairly low um, and they're bred to resist a pest that's called the carrot rust fly. These guys lay their eggs, they go into the soil, the larvae come out and they burrow into your carrots. They make these unattractive holes. They eat your carrots from the inside out. Um, just not nice. It just kind of ruins your whole crop. Um, one of the reasons I don't have to use these all the time is because my bed is about 18 inches tall. Carrot rust flies typically only grow, they can only fly about two feet tall, or two feet high, sorry. And so if they can't get up into my bed, I don't really have to worry about them laying eggs and burrowing in. Um, but like I said, if you have to worry about that, use the fly away or pick your favorite carrot and put your hoops in. You can put your row cover over top, secure it all along the edges. When the carrot rust fly is out, it'll stop them from getting in, okay? That's why I had the hoops there. Now, carrots are finicky. They're picky. And they are super, super tiny. So one of the things that works really, really well is to get your bed all ready. And then you're going to wet it. You want your soil nice and moist. It's really wet under here because I've done this already. But it's a little bit breezy, so the top part dried out. And that's one of the reasons why this method I'm going to show you works so well is because you use a board and it's going to stop the soil from drying out so much. You can take your board, you put it on the soil, you press down a little bit just so you're making a little bit of a an indentation and that just helps oh this is a good thing if you can see there's a little indent here that's why using the board and pressing it down works because when you water or if it was to rain really hard because the seeds are so teeny tiny they get washed away and you'll have a whole little clump of carrot seeds in one spot and then you're going to have to thin them so you've more work with fewer results because you had to throw those carrots away but so that just shows me where my carrot seeds are going to go i'm going to do i'm going to do the nantes and with these you're just going to take them and, and it's hard to do you guys but all you're going to do is try to put one seed, about one every inch and a half, two inches, and then just press it down into the soil. It is really hard to just get one seed. So you probably are going to have to, woohoo, let's have a party over here. You're going to have to thin them. Some people will broadcast them, which is fine. It just means you are going to have to thin them. And so, like I said, you're just going to poke them in. You don't have to cover them. And when the whole row is done, you're going to take the board and you're just going to 
put it back on top. You're going to make sure that it's got good contact and you're going to leave it there. After about five or six days, you can come and take a look, pick it up, see if any of them are sprouting. If they are, take the board off. They're going to need to get the sun so they can photosynthesize and get growing, okay? Um, if it consistently rains out and we get heavy, heavy storms, you don't have to worry about it because the soil around here is going to soak up the water and your seeds are going to be protected. Um, if it's a really, really sunny, hot, hot time when you're doing this, then take your watering can and water around the outside edges. Or you can use the really like light spray that I had going and you can water them that way. You just don't want to dislodge all your seeds from where they're growing. Um, it can take up to two weeks for these things to sprout. So don't be impatient. <laughs> I always say wait five or six days. You know tomorrow I'm going to come out and I'm going to check, make sure everything's going okay. But you know, that's the way to do it. Um, I have used cardboard on top too, which works just fine. You just have to make sure that it stays wet because it does dry out fairly quickly if you're doing this on a lovely hot summer day. Wood seems to work really, really well. And that is it for carrots. Thanks. Sometimes you just need to feed your spirit. So this is actually more of a story for kids. And it's kind of fun. And you know it's going to be a good story and you know it's true because it starts out with once upon a time there was a girl and her name was Di Sentra and she was a lovely girl and by lovely I mean she was very kind she was good to all her friends she had a couple of pet rabbits that she took very very good care of um, she was a responsible girl most of the time she followed the rules because she knew what was good for her but there was one day when they were having a dance in town and she was so excited because there was almost nothing more than dancing that this girl loved to do. Di was just, woo! She was going to get to wear her favorite pink dress. She got to put on her fancy dangling earrings. She had her special dancing shoes. And she was going to take her rabbits for a night out. Well, Remember I told you she was responsible and she knew that there were rules that were safe to keep her safe? Well, she was so excited and she took so long getting ready that she figured she'd take a shortcut through the woods. And you know with these stories, if you take a shortcut through the woods, you're gonna be in trouble. And she was. Because this happened so long ago, it was back in the day when people still learned magic. And there was an old crone in those woods. And a crone's just a grumpy old lady that doesn't like having people bother her. And as Di went tripping down this path off to the dance, she was singing and she was skipping and the lady got annoyed and went and used her wand and turned Di into a little flower and hung her on a bush. And she said, you can stay there until one of your friends comes to find you. Well, poor Di was really upset. Meanwhile, back at the dance, all her friends are wondering, where's Di? Where's Di? We can't find her. Oh, we better go check that path. I bet she took the shortcut. So they all went trundling down this path. And as they're going, all of a sudden, one of the boys goes, wait, did you guys hear that? And he goes, that sounds like it's coming from that bush over there. And he goes and he looks and he takes this flower off and he goes, oh, look, it's Di. And there she is in her pretty pink dress. And she turned back into herself. But you know, that bush was so impressed with her friends and with Di that it decided that it would grow these flowers every year after so people would remember, don't take the path, go the way you're supposed to go, don't bug people. But remember I said Di had two pet rabbits? Well, if you take this flower apart and you peel off this pink part, there are her bunnies. How cute is that? So 
there's her bunnies. Remember I said she had dangly earrings? There's one earring and there's the other earring. But what about her dancing slippers? She had her favorite dancing slippers. There's one. And there's the other one. And you know what? There's even the magic wand that, I, that old crone used. But go find a bleeding heart. See if you can find the bunny and the earrings and the slippers and the wand. And if you don't like how I told the story, change it up and make your own. Bye.